Welcome to the Everyday Board Game Podcast with Daniel. And Daniel. And you are joining us today on one of our top eight debates. This week specifically, we are going to be debating the top eight IP rated games based on novels or literature. Uh, this was a definitely this was definitely a different list for us. Um, it is a sequel to our last list last week, where we did the top eight IP games based on movie, film, and radio. And then at the end of this, we are going to make another little bonus feature where we are going to debate the number one seed from this versus the number one seed from last, or I'm sorry, the winner of last week, which ended up being, which one was Horrified. it? Horrified, yeah. And so that's going to be a really fun debate here in a bit. And so right now we have a few different seeds that we're going to get into here in a bit. Um... Let's talk about what our viewers said about some of these. Once again, uh, pretty obviously opinionated polls, but we had some different ones that were... that uh, One of them I didn't understand. Daniel, w would you mind reading the notes from Facebook? Uh, yes. Uh, so the one I'm guessing you are going to say is the comment from Stephen. Nanti Narking Count? Yeah, I mean, maybe. I don't know what that is. I'm not yeah, saying yeah, it doesn't. Exactly. Never even heard of that before, so... <laughs> sure. Uh, and the only other comment we got for sure is the one that's actually leading our um, novels-based uh, games right now, and that's Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings, nice, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, one person really was excited about Lord of the Rings. And, I mean, we I've played Lord of the Rings Journey to Middle-Earth, and that's the first Lord of the Rings game that I played that was really, really thematic. That actually gave you the Lord of the Rings feel. Mind you, the only other Lord of the Rings game I've ever played is uh, Lord of the Rings uh, Love Letter. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Lord of the Rings Love Letter. That's not exactly thematic, well, I, I would say. I, I, I did play Lord of the Ring Risk, which actually is a bit thematic, because if the, the ring makes it to Mount Doom, you lose. That's true. That's true. I mean, it's just... But it uses Risk. Kill yeah, things with dice, right? You know? Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with Risk as a game. We we are playing Risk Legacy at the moment, but it's, you know, it, it's not the same. It's definitely not the same. So, uh, okay, for once on the poll, I don't know if you noticed, but every single game at least got one vote. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, last week we had Thanos Rising and I think Harry Potter. Uh, no, Harry Potter had a few votes. But there was Thanos Rising and one other game... Ghostbusters. No, 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 Ghostbusters. It was uh, Thanos Rising and Hogwarts that didn't get uh, votes. No, no, uh, Ghostbusters did not get any votes. Okay. Harry Potter had a few. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's either way. Like, it's... They weren't showing the love, but now this time did. And I think only one other... Uh, one other game really got on to the top eight. Like, that was added on by a user... Um, I forget which game that was. Which one was it? it was, I think it was... Pillars of the Earth, the Trilogy. Pillars of the Earth, the Trilogy, yeah. That that got quite a few votes. And, you know, I've played the Pillars of the Earth Builder's Duel by Stefan Feld, and that's really enjoyable, but it's not yeah, quite the uh, same. There's another game that got added on, uh, Who Goes There? Who Goes There? Yeah, I don't know. I guess Never that's based... Never even heard of that one. It, I don't know what it's based off of, but, I mean, it's obviously something. Yeah. Yeah. So, have you been playing anything recently? Um, I have. Uh, we just recently played last night, uh, Lewis and Clark. That was actually fun. Yeah? How was it? I had a good time. Yeah. At least you didn't win, so I was happy. <laughs> I know. Our, our mutual friend, Dom, he, he was playing with us, and he came out of nowhere. He ended up getting, like, I think he was at the negative fifth position or something. Yeah, he was all the way at the bottom. He couldn't go any further lower on the negative. Well, he he had one more spot he could have gone. And I hovered over it to read what it says. And it said that if you end your turn there or something, you lose, like, all of your resources. And, like, it's a huge, massive hit to you. And I didn't want to tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> because I would have felt even more bad. But, yeah, he came out of nowhere. We were halfway up the board, and then he ended up winning. It was yeah. insane. So, yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. Uh, very enjoyable. And we played one other game. We played King Domino. 
I didn't do too well in that one. That more for the reason because the wife had just showed up with dinner, so I was like, ah, screw that. I'm gonna eat instead. Yeah, I, I got food in front of me. Who needs this? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Other than that, I've been keeping an eye on Kickstarter because I'm in one of these Kickstarters on, and Frosthaven looks like they just broke the record. Wow, the most funded board game of all time on Kickstarter, huh? Uh, yep, I'm sitting at it, and let me go ahead and refresh this page and see what happens. But they are sitting at twelve point uh, $12,485,719. Wow, yeah, that's that's broken the record, so good job to that's Gloomhaven, good job yeah. to Isaac Childress for, for um, Frosthaven breaking that record right now, and who yeah, knows how long that'll stay. three hours to go, so let's see where it ends up, that's going to be interesting. Right, the record was previously set by Kingdom Death Monster. And then the second place until that was like eight million with exploding kittens. So and then I do want to give a shout out to the creators of Kingdom Death Monsters. They actually posted saying they want a worthy opponent and at on their Kickstarter page <laughs> saying, "Go back this. We uh, we uh, challenger has arrived. Go back. Uh, go help them." That's awesome. I didn't realize yeah. that. That's really fantastic of them. Wow. Good for them. That's fantastic. Well, I. I have been playing a game recently that I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about. So I watched the Shut Up and Sit Down solo gaming uh, series. They had two videos. One was about games that are in print. And because of that series, I bought this game called Fire, which is a Freedom and Freeze game. It's a fable game. Uh, it's based off of basically asteroids or invaders oh, or whatever. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty bad cover. The art is fine on the cards, but yeah, that cover... Uh, the, the guy's standing with an open mouth facing a screen. This is super generic looking. But, you know, it's whatever. Um, but, the game itself, it took me three tries to finally beat level one. And I'll try level two later on. But then his second video, he, he posted about print and play games that are for solo players. And I found a few of those. I printed those out. And I tried the demo for uh, Super Skill Pinball coming out by WizKids. And... It's one I was really excited for, and I think it's just the rules need refining and being a little more clear. So they didn't exactly say what, how to play it. But there was one that really intrigued me, and it's this thing. The Bargain Basement Bathosphere of Beachside Bay. <laughs> amazing cover, or amazing yeah, title, for, first off. For the audience at home, this is not the first time I heard about it. Yeah. No, I, I've been ranting about it, because I played... So let me show you the video of this, and I know it won't make sense for our audio listeners, I'll do my best to explain it, but I you play over a series of campaigns, uh, or this campaign has a number of chapters, each that you go back, you're only supposed to score the very first time you play it. So here's my first game of it, and if you're familiar with Deep Sea Adventure, this is how it plays, basically. You roll a number of dice based on this number here. So you have five dice starting off, and you pick a die to go down. If you land exactly on one of the action spaces, you mark it off and you don't take the action, which most of the actions are bad. They cause stress on your boat, or they use up oxygen levels. But if you pass an action, then you must take it. So you'll see that I started losing a lot. I had a lot of stress going down here, and I came pretty close to the end. But basically, you're trying to go down a path. When you decide to stop, you turn around, and go back up and if you can make it back to the top then you survived even if you touch the floor the ocean floor and you don't make it back to the top you're dead you you're done anyway you don't get points for it and it's a really intriguing thing because if you land on a space that you've previously landed on well then that's that's also stressful and that causes stress to your bathosphere but then at the same time you have to spend oxygen to get your dice pool back and re-roll it so it's really intriguing because you have all these things that you're trying to mitigate, hopefully getting the right amounts of dice rolling, uh, not causing too much problems for you to land on the spaces, not causing too much stress. It, it was really enjoyable, and I'm excited to continue playing this. I've printed chapter one or chapter zero and chapter one, and I think it's 38 pages for the first three chapters total. And they have mini games on top of it. Yeah. And and for chapters four through six, it's another selection through Board Game Geek. But it's all completely free. The guy made it for anybody to enjoy. And, like, I don't 
I don't think there's spo I don't think this is spoilers, but look away now if you don't want to see it. Um, on certain games, there's like mini games over the entire thing. Where if you notice here on this page, there is octopi that you can land on and you can discover different kinds of fish and octopi. Well, then you also have a thing called the Aqua Museum or Aquasium that you are actually filling in the different kind of fish that you discover and that will pertain to different things throughout the game. And then also on top of that... I'll stick to Animal Crossing when it comes to filling the museum. Right, right exactly, with fish, exactly. I, I would too, but I don't have Animal Crossing at the moment, so this will have to do. <laughs> but then on top of that, you have like this massive map that you play over the campaign and, there, and you're exploring the ocean depths of different regions and then certain things like will call back and it's just it's really intriguing and the fact that this guy made it for free he could have easily done a kickstarter and sold it but that's pretty cool yeah i think it's really nice that he did that so that's what i've been playing a lot of solo games uh i got a few solo well solo s games coming in the mail i have cartographers that has a solo variant mm -hmm. uh castles of burgundy the dice game has a solo variant i just picked up uh Archaeology, the new expedition, that doesn't really have a solo, but uh, for a card game, it looks really, really fun. So, oh, yeah, yeah, can't well, wait to get those in. Yeah, it's gonna be phenomenal. I, I'm loving on the Phil Walker Harding games right now. I just got Cacao in the mail, already punched out all the boards, um, Gingerbread House, and I just ordered that last night as well. So, Archaeology will be coming to me <laughs> soon after yours. <laughs> Yeah, so it's, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to actually things starting to settle down. Um, like I said, um, I don't think we were on podcast on Wednesday, but even with everything opening up, I'm just going to keep my game group small, our normal yeah. game group of five people I can handle. I don't know if I'll be going to like uh, game nights at the shop for a little bit until sure. everything kind of calms down. But I'm going to have games to play, so there's that. There you go, right? Yeah, no, we're looking forward to that too. So let's jump into our honorable mentions. And uh, I, I'm very curious to hear what your honorable mentions are. So I'll go ahead and start this and, and let you finalize it. But uh, my first honorable mention is a culmination of like technically 11 different games. And that's any games that are specifically like bookshelf series. Like I have this one, uh, like okay. the Aladdin... Uh, fairy tale series that comes from Brain Game, Purple Brain Games, and Yellow. Each one of these are based off of a book, and it even has the fairy tale written in it. And then I'm also including the Choose Your Own Adventure games with that, because it really was the book, yeah. and and they made a game hugely based off of it. But the the whole premise was for it to look like the book, and be a game implementation of it. Um, whereas it's not so much based off of the literature it's just that it's a, an exact gamification of the book of itself the book, yeah right and so I, and it's funny because i was actually going to choose that but i figured you were going to have it on your honorable mentions the, sure. uh, not the, uh, that but the what is it choose house of danger or yep. uh battle of the master of the universe or something like that yeah and so yeah no i uh I agree. Those are really good games and based off novels. They're literally re-implementation of the book. So Right. Yeah, so they're not necessarily based. They are the game version. Right? <laughs> yeah, that is true. <coughs> so um, my on a first honorable mention, I only have two, just so you know, uh, is one that I've mentioned as an honorable mention before during the worker placement. Uh, worker placement top eight debate and that is abomination era frankenstein nice um it's not a big implementation implementation of say you know frankenstein mary show it's frankenstein but it's the the sequel to it you are doctors who are being black belled by the monster to make him a companion or some of them are just crazy and are down to do it just to be the heir to Frankenstein and build another creature for yeah. him to have a companion and I, I really enjoy the game I think it's a good implementation it's dark and macabre so it's not really for children no um, I would say mid-teens would be a good estimation maybe 14, 15 would probably be good if you allow your kid to watch a rated R movie and they're old enough to understand what's going on, then yeah. But uh, I wouldn't say any anybody younger than 10 should play this game. Oh, yeah. No, I would probably... 
I probably wouldn't let my kids play until somewhere between 15, maybe 13 at earliest, but yeah, probably 15. Yeah, and then the big thing is, like, if, like, the, the board game that we've been talking, talked about last week, uh, The Shining, mm-hmm. um, that one is basically 17 and above. I say this game is around that level, too, sure. just because how macabre it is. But it's such a fun game. I understand some people don't like the swinging nature of it and that you need to make body parts, but you're building Frankenstein monsters, so... Yeah. Yeah, which, you, I mean, that only mean, makes sense, yeah. You yeah. can't build it off of tofu or anything. Like, that would just be weird. Well, you can use animal parts, which is kind of cool. That, that, that makes sense, yeah. But you're not doing, like, a vegan Frankenstein. <laughs> like, <laughs> exactly. Bean curd and foliage. And soybeans. Yeah, soybeans. Fermented soybeans. And my other honorable mention is a game that I've been playing lately, based on Robinson Crusoe, and I am terrible at this game. I still have yet to beat it. Friday. It's such a fun solo game. I played on an airplane. I've talked about it before. Um, that was really... That and Oniram were the first two games that I played that were based off of... Or that were solo games that I ever started playing. And I didn't think of myself as a solo gamer prior to that. Now I do. You know, they, they've been really a lot of fun. So that's been my second one. I don't know much about the lore behind it. And I understand that it's a quick fix. But... God, is that game difficult. <laughs> I have yet to well, beat it. Yeah, the, the Robinson Crusoe board game, the which should uh, would have been on our list if both of us had played it. I don't think either one of us had played that one. Right. Uh, actually takes some from the book itself, and the book is a really deep read, you know what I mean? Um, it's, it's difficult in the book watching him survive the way he does, so... Oh, okay. Understandable that the game is difficult. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, that that's, out of all the solo games, that has easily the highest loss ratio for me right now. So, uh, just before I get into my final final honorable mention, I just want to let people know, I am a reader, so every game on here, I have read the books for. Oh, every one, okay. Uh, yeah, so, uh, let's see. Red, red, uh, not all the way through, like uh, our eight seed, spoiler alert, Dresden Files. I've only read the first three books. Um, in the process of reading more, but I'm not actually in other books at the moment. But yeah, um, haven't read all the H.P. Lovecraft books, right. uh, but I have read some. And yeah, everything else I've read, well, there's one game that's a plethora of books. I've read most of them in the base game. Okay, that works. <laughs> and we'll get to those as soon as we, as soon as we do that, for sure. Yeah, the other, like, I, I was surprised that um, there wasn't any good 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea book. There's lots of them based off of Captain Nemo or, well, I know there's and the Nautilus. Well, I know there's one that's really good that people talk about. Yeah, I just haven't played it. I think it's a Nemo's solo War. game. Huh? Nemo's, Nemo's War? Nemo's yeah. War, yeah. Yeah, I bought Nautilus because I love that theme, and that's one of the few books. I'm not a reader, but I have read that book, and I liked it a lot. And I've also... 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is my favorite Jules Verne book. Yeah. Yeah, it's except for the chapters that he was writing that you could tell he was obviously really hungry because <laughs> because he just goes into like all the details of how different the fish taste and it's like come on dude like Well, like, again, as someone who reads Stephen King, I'm used to people play or writing um very descriptive of stuff we're doing. At least with uh, Jules Verne on that one it's about food. Some of the Stephen King stuff he gets descriptive with. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, he, he can go off on a tangent, can he? Oh, yeah, yeah, actually, uh, I'm surprised. It takes there's... like 10 pages just to write what they fill. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's That's how he makes like a 700-page book every month. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? That's the only way. But, yeah, I have not read any of the books based off of any of these uh, personally. But, so, as far as implementation of the theme, there is one that I have read most of the first book. In the series, and I'll talk about that when I get to it. All right. So, and my last honorable mention before before we can wrap the, this part of it up, okay, is Arkham Horror the LCG. Oh uh, yeah. Um, and as you were mentioning earlier about like Friday and Oniram about solo gaming, this is my go-to solo game. I, I I'm in two campaigns of this game. I'm in a two-player campaign with our buddy Bryce. And then I'm in the solo campaign by myself playing this game as two characters. Um, 
It just it's easier. You can play with one characters. It's just easier to set up two characters to go through it. Sure. But I, I thoroughly enjoy it. I've got a few expansions in here. I need a few. I want to get like one of the bigger box expansions. But to me, this gives me the Arkham Horror game in a, such a short amount of time. I could play this in an hour, if that. Sometimes it's a little shorter. Sometimes it's a little longer. But on average, it's about sixty minutes. I can, and that's with setup and everything. If yeah. I play, say, an Elder Tour or an Arkham Horror uh, editions, that's three, four hours on playing. And yeah. the setup itself is add on another 30 minutes or so, depending on who you're going against, if you have to build up uh, extra boards and stuff like that. So this is, for me, other than Elder Signs, uh, Elder Sign is the Arkham Horror game that I will go to. But this one gives me the campaign, which is why I really, really enjoy it. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I've been meaning to play it. I just have not done it yet. I had the Lord of the Rings one. It would have been on the brackets if you had played it. Yep, yep. It was rated high enough. So Uh, my apologies for not playing it. Uh, Any of the fans out there that like it, you know, I'll get it to the table eventually. (laughs) Maybe. I really enjoy it. It's a really good game. Um, My thing is, uh, LCGs, uh, the same grape I had with X-Wing, I kind of ignore with Arkham Horror LCG just because... Yeah, I'm paying a lot to keep going, but at least with this one, I'm paying to keep the campaign going. Yeah. With X-Wing, you're not really doing a campaign. You're just getting more ships to fight with. Right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I There there was one that I wish that we, we could have made a game, or I wish that there was a game based off of it. It's by um, Terry Brooks. It's called the Magic Kingdom for Sale, or the Landover series. Actually, I... I, I halfway through the first book in that and it's hilarious it's amazing quester thews is one of the best characters in the world oh man it's it's amazing and we just got a text from our friend and apparently frosthaven just hit 12.5 so good job frosthaven that is now the newest definitely one i just got a text from him oh yeah i got it it's right here yep so i have my phone on silent this way it doesn't pop up so you've been reading uh magic kingdom for sale uh, it's one of the books I've been reading. I'm reading a, a true story psychological book that I don't want to get into for our audience. Sure. Because it, it's it's a rough book. Um, and it deals with some uh, stuff that some childhood trauma and mm. uh, mental disorders and stuff like that. Really good book. It's really hard to read, but I'm, uh, my friend recommended it. And it's, it's, it's hard, but it's good. Awesome. Uh, it deals with like uh, split personalities as well. So. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Um, and then I'm also reading uh, Brandon Sanderson's *The Way of the King*. Okay. Uh, it's a part of the Stormlight. It's the first book in the Stormlight Archive. It's just such a big book, and so I go back and forth on my books. Like, okay, I'm getting a little tired of reading this story, so I'll go start this one. And that's what happened with *The Magical Kingdom* or Makes for sense. sale. But yeah, I have been reading it. It's about halfway through. Um, and the reason why is I got those other two books that I'm reading, uh, it's because reading the, the, I'm just going to go ahead and mention the title if someone wants to look it up. It's called When a Rabbit, When Rabbit Howls. Um, that's such a hard book that I have to put it down for a little bit and I need something to alleviate me because it's, 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 if you've ever read a child called It, this is worse. Hmm. Wow. And so I go ahead and I read, um like Magic Kingdom for sale just because I need that fun that or if I need like an adventure and escapism I read the way of the king so cool yeah I need to get more into uh, into my audiobooks lately I have I have listened to the entire oh. Landover series and I do like it don't even get me started on the audiobooks I'm listening to because actually I put audiobooks on while I'm editing these videos that go up on YouTube oh nice it's uh this way I'm listening to us in one here and I, at least I have something to distract me until I find my <laughs> break points. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I like to, I'm going to mention this to all the people since we're doing IPs. If you read any or listen to audiobooks, I highly recommend doing the Star Wars audiobooks if you have a chance to get them because they, it's one of the few audiobooks that have sound effects that work. So when they're talking about like X-wing fights, you can hear the X-wings flying by in your ear while they're That's talking cool. about the battles. You hear the lightsaber battles if it's Jedi's fighting like Siths and stuff like that. You hear the lightsabers going on in the background while still getting the narration. Oh, I I, I can't get enough. I, in fact, I prefer listening to the Star Wars audiobooks than actually reading the Star Wars books. That's awesome. 
That is, that's fantastic. Yeah, maybe I should get into that. That'd be good. Well, I think we've belabored the point long enough. Let's get into the bracket. We're going to take a quick pause so I can get the video recording correctly. And then uh, we will jump right into it. And here we go. <laughs> 